Jade Falcon Invasion Corridor, Lyran Commonwealth, System, Leskovic, September 3050. Slowing her ascent, Anala didn't intend to be the first over the ridge. From the aerial overflight intel, it was clear that the Lyran militia still defending Leskovic were going to make things difficult by retreating into the refinery complex in the valley below. Still, it wasn't her call, nor would she ever make such calls. The Jade Falcons were running this operation, and while the Diamond Sharks were nominally included in this part of the campaign, it was made clear that the Sharks were to provide support and little else. That was fine with Anala. Slowing to a stop, the 20-ton piranha she piloted always looked like it was about to pounce. In fact, there were stories from mech warriors who claimed the machine had an innate need to hunt and would almost lurch forward on its own if not closely attended. Of course, such stories were nonsense, but Anala liked them anyway. It was a fine machine and had served her well in the past year since her disastrous trial of position. That might sound like rationalization, but Anala really had grown to love the speed and ferocity of the Piranha. While it would never hold the prestige of an Omnimech, it was difficult to argue with the results. While she watched the second Falcon Jaegers cross over the ridge a kilometer away and start their descent down toward the complex, Anala double-checked the feeds on her 12 machine guns. Individually, each gun did paltry damage to armored units, but when all 12 guns were firing, the results could be devastating. When the Falcons reached the outskirts of the refinery and started trading shots with the militia inside, in among the machinery and countless kilometers of pipework, Anala's comlink opened. Right and left wings flank the refinery and prevent any militia from escaping. This fight ends today, the unmistakable voice of Star Captain Galley said with a bluster. Anala and the rest of her scouting star accelerated and crossed over the ridgeline. Each of the mechs in the star was fast enough to run rings around most intersphere mechs. The trotting of the piranha turned into a run as the star took an arcing path around the outskirts of the refinery. A few minutes later, they were coming around the far side of the complex. We have two tanks making a break for it. Get on it, Anala, Galley ordered. I am on it, Anala said as she pushed her mech hard forward. Operating on the edge of the mech's capabilities, the endosteel bones flexed with every sprinting step. Before the tanks could turn to face the oncoming mech, she was upon them. Squeezing the triggers of her control sticks, Anala smiled as the mech roared with the sound of twelve machine guns firing. Her target was awash with sparks and smoke from splintering and burning armor. What felt like glorious minutes of carnage only lasted roughly a second as the piranha ran right by its target traveling at 151 kilometers per hour. Even twisting the mech's torso only brought another fraction of a second of fire on target before she was past it. Still, that was enough. The tank she hit was belching black smoke and the crew inside were desperately trying to escape and clear away from the vehicle. The tank next to it accelerated to get away. Moments later, as Anala was still circling around for another run, the tank she hit exploded, sending the turret sailing up into the sky before crashing down into the scrub brush. As Anala banked the piranha, she could see the fighting within the refinery complex was intensifying. Missiles streaked in low arcs across the sky, lasers cut through pipework, and plumes of dark smoke billowed up into the light blue sky. The Falcons were nothing if not blunt. Now facing the second tank, which was creating a large dust cloud in its attempt to flee the battle, Anala scowled. Chasing down retreating cowards wasn't exactly glorious work. Aiming her reticle, Anala led with a medium laser shot at distance first, which sliced into the left track of the tank. It spun off like a flail, and the tank ground to a near halt just as she opened up on it with the machine guns. Armor-piercing rounds the length of a human finger burrowed into the plate armor. Transferring all that kinetic energy created heat and weakened it for the next round that hit it a nanosecond later. Plates melted, buckled, and exploded in shards that spread out in every direction. There are a few infantry stragglers, but they are surrendering, Anala reported, bringing her mech to a stop in front of the beleaguered and beaten militia who had tossed their weapons and were holding up their hands over their heads. Before receiving a response from the star captain, Anala's entire view screen flashed. She turned just in time to see the shockwave from the exploding refinery as it traveled across the valley. Her mech was hit a second later, knocking it head over heels. 
She slammed her head back against the command chair and it felt like she was just stomped on by a direwolf. After a few seconds, the comm link crackled back to life. What in Kerensky's name was that? Did the Lyrans use a nuclear weapon on their own troops? No, my sensors don't show any radioactivity. Opening her eyes, Anala groaned from the sensation of the rapidly intensifying headache. She looked through the piranha's viewscreen and could see the light blue of the sky along with a dark mushroom cloud. Maybe they hit something, a storage tank with something like hydrogen or natural gas? Anala said, setting her mech up into a sitting position and taking in the view of the charred hellscape that now dominated the valley. Every bit of the refinery looked as if it were a smashed child's toy that was then soaked in kerosene and set ablaze. Absorbing the carnage and implications of the destruction in front of her, Anala sighed, rubbed her shaved head and said, We're going to need some new falcons. The Piranha has always been a bit of an enigma in the eyes of inner sphere tacticians and historians. Its specs suggest that it would be an effective second line scout clan mech, but inexplicably the armament makes it a potent striker in a way that hits way above its weight. Without the original designers to weigh in on it, we can really only speculate on what they were going for with this original design for this feisty 20 tonner. What information we have suggests that the mech's popularity has been well earned. The Brana seems to have hit the perfect balance between form and function. Though it really isn't technically a totem mech, it does have that predatorial look that fits so well with its name. First spotted in the Inner Sphere in 3051, the Piranha was used to great effect against light units like infantry and vehicles. The design was originally the child of Clan Diamond Shark, which produced it in reasonable numbers as a second line battle mech. However, like with so many other second line clan battle mechs, it started to outshine its more noble Omni mech peers. It would be nice to know more about the design process. Maybe someday historians will access those records if they still exist in the hands of Clan Sea Fox. Though it was proposed that it would work well in packs, much in the same way that the carnivorous piranha operates in the wilds of ancient Terra, the Diamond Sharks didn't really use them that way. The records were fairly sparse until Tukiad, where the Diamond Sharks used the piranha in substantial numbers. Up to that point, the Diamond Sharks had not participated in serious campaigns against the Inner Sphere forces, so data is limited. When it came to Tukiad, no one, perhaps besides the Wolves, really understood what they were going up against with the Comguard, and the Sharks were in just way over their heads. Khan Ian Hawker bid only five clusters of the Tumen in exchange for a good landing zone on a plateau just north of their objectives. The planning was very by the book and based upon minimizing travel time and logistics between the objectives while concealing the headquarters. Success would be achieved through the conquest and control of the towns of Kazis Prime and Yurkanat. The low rolling hills and fallow agricultural land between the LZ and the objectives were seen as perfect places for the swift of foot diamond sharks to fight. Unfortunately for the sharks, Common Star's forces had really no intention of fighting out in the open. Urkanat was nestled in amongst volcanic rock formations which limited movement and would pen in the clan forces. Doing what overconfident military leaders have done since the beginning of time, Khan Hawker split his forces between the two objectives and the LZ. The landing was uncontested and the spirits were high. The assaults on the two objectives would take place simultaneously with a free birth cluster left behind to guard the LZ and prevent breakthroughs by Comstar forces. That reserve cluster included a significant number of piranhas. Inexperience and arrogance would combine as the diamond shark attacks were delayed and then delayed again under the strain of inadequate logistics. The calm guard forces took advantage of every second of gifted time before the assault and prepared to dig in around the two towns. Since this isn't a Tukiad video, we're not going to go into great detail on the disastrous failure of the two assaults. The more important bit for us today is that when the Sakan finally called for the aid of the Omega Cluster, they smashed into the Calm Guard with ferocity that shocked their opponents. Up to that point, the Diamond Sharks had underperformed on every metric, and suddenly the Calm Guard mechs were being felled by Freebirth Warriors piloting second line battle mechs. The Piranha was shown to be particularly fierce in the disorganized fray where it could run free and hit targets through the thinner back armor. The Omega Cluster mechs saved their Khan who had been encircled and deserve credit for preventing a complete rout of the Diamond Shark forces on the planet. 
the death of the Khan or Sakan would have been particularly embarrassing above and beyond their inability to take either objective. Though the Omega Cluster would end up being wiped out on Tukiad, they demonstrated that Freeborn Warriors could be exceptionally capable and their second line equipment was dangerous as any other battle mech on the field. Following Tukiad, the Diamond Sharks and their Piranhas were not a common sight in the Inner Sphere. Some suggested that the production of the mech might have been stopped entirely. However, we know now that wasn't the case. The focus of the Diamond Sharks was shifting and other clans would start to take notice of the possibilities in the Piranha. The mech started to be found in the Tumens of other clans who were purchasing it along with other Diamond Shark produced technology. The original Piranha was built around a 180 Firebox XL engine and a Bergen 14 Endo Steel internal structure. Both of these were integral to the mech's ability to travel at up to 151 kilometers per hour. That's 93 miles per hour for those of you in America. The manufacturer, Constantine Assembly Plant M27AE, has gone through considerable effort to pick quality parts that will not wear down quickly under the stresses that a rapidly moving light mech can generate. The Able 7 sensor suite included in the mech is also a solid choice for a system that has to keep track of a target while on the move. With only 4 tons of armor, the Piranha is relying upon its speed for survival. No section of the mech can survive more than a single medium laser hit, so if you're piloting one, keep moving. For those of you playing at home, moving 10 plus hexes is a 4 plus modifier for someone trying to hit you. I don't want to tell anyone how to play the game, but if you're moving fewer than 10 hexes per turn in your Piranha, you're doing it wrong. Now that we've covered the good bones, engine, and ability to run laps around most other mechs, let's talk about the most memorable feature for anyone who encounters a Piranha in the field. The inclusion of 12 Series 12 rotary machine guns split between the left and right torsos was an unusual choice which breaks with conventional mech design which tends to focus on one or two main weapons and the rest being secondary. In the case of the Piranha, even though it is also equipped with two Mark III ER medium lasers, the number of machine guns and their potential damage output makes them feel like the primary. In fact, many people forget the lasers are even there especially since the 10 standard heat sinks prevent the Piranha from alpha striking with them without considerable heat buildup. It's strange, and I like it. The possibility of hitting with up to 24 damage with those machine guns on a vulnerable mech, or even doing even better against infantry, is tantalizing. There's also an ER small laser in the center torso, but as many times as I've used the Piranha, I don't think I've ever hit with it. I may be cursed, so your mileage may vary. Discussions of the later variants of the Piranha are tied to dates and the clans which procured them. In 3066, Clan Ice Hellion won the rights to build their own Piranhas. This is where Diamond Shark, soon to be Sea Fox, lost control of the design. They're still going to be producing their own, but also there's going to be other clans as well. A Clan Hell's Horses battle report submitted by the Watch representative included information about a new variant of the Piranha which eschewed the machine guns in exchange for ER micro lasers. They were referring to what is known as the Piranha 2. Structurally, the mech is the same, except for the upgrade to 11 double heatsinks. The 12 ER micro lasers are split across the right and left torsos, while the ER medium lasers are replaced by medium heavy lasers. In the center torso, there is a small heavy laser. Theoretically, the Piranha 2 could do up to 28 damage in an alpha strike, however that would leave the mech at plus 7 heat at the end of the turn if stationary, so that's pretty toasty boy. Switching from machine guns to lasers to no longer worry about ammunition is tempting, and the additional hex of range with the ER micro lasers is nice. However, I think there's something hard to quantify that is lost from the original. Part of it is limiting the mech's effective range by removing those ER medium lasers, which cuts the reach of the mech by 40%. If I had to make a judgment call between the OG Piranha and the Piranha 2, I think it would really depend upon how you plan on using it. All things being equal, I'm going to go with the original. The clan Snow Raven Watch picked up another variant of the Piranha, also fielded by the Ice Hellions. The Piranha 3 has 10 double heat sinks and is equipped with a targeting computer, 8 ER micro lasers, 2 micro pulse lasers, and 2 ER medium lasers. Additionally, it also carries an active probe. This is an interesting variant as it is not only a potent hunter of light mechs, but also closer to an actual scout mech than the previous other two incarnations. In the Raven Watch report, these Piranha were running in stars with Locust 2Cs, which is absolutely terrifying. 
the inclusion of the targeting computer makes those racks of lasers all the more dangerous. The Piranha 4 started making its first appearances in 3072, and is closer to a pure upgrade to the original than the 2 or 3. In the 4, the two ER medium lasers are tied to a targeting computer, and only 4 of the original 12 machine guns remain. However, they are part of a machine gun array which improves battlefield performance. We'll talk about it more in a minute. Additionally, four light machine guns are in the second machine gun array. The only thing missing from the Piranha 4, which would make it a fantastic upgrade, is the lack of the double heat sinks. Though I think that's exactly why we weren't given them. So sad. Now you're probably asking, what's the point of the machine gun array? That's a question we dealt with yesterday, talking in Discord. I talked in multiple Discords to where I want to be 100% sure concerning the rule for these machine gun arrays. Uh, thanks to the somewhat clear information in the Total Warfare source book, the MG Array 2-Hit Roll is a single roll. So if you've got four machine guns in your array, that's one roll for it. No matter how many machine guns you have in your array, it's one. They either all hit or they all miss. If they hit, the next step is to consult the cluster hits table using the level of the array. So four machine guns would use a four on the table. Then you roll for the cluster hits to determine how many are hitting the single location. Finally, you roll what single location is going to be receiving a gift of multiple hits. This matters because each hit can trigger a critical hit roll if the target location is bereft of armor. Clear as mud, right? On the bright side, the array can be triggered on and off by the user during the end phase of a turn. If you prefer to shoot each gun individually, that's the mechanism to do it. You can also declare that they're off at the beginning of the game and not even worry about it. Oh, and when targeting conventional infantry with an array, the cluster hits table is not used and all of the shots are automatically going to do their damage times the number of guns in the array. For the Piranha 4, the 4 machine gun array, that would be 2d6 times 4. That means a machine gun 4 array could do up to 48 damage to a group of unaugmented infantry. Now we understand why an array would be useful, especially against infantry. 48 damage is much better than 8, because I'm good at math. People smarter than I pointed out that with an MG4 array, you would have a 54% chance of wiping out an entire infantry platoon when you take that damage roll. And don't forget double damage if you catch those little goobers out in the open. Now that 90% of the audience is asleep from the rules talk, we'll move on. There is a Piranha 5, which showed up in 3140. It looks a lot like the original Piranha, except the ER medium lasers are swapped out for medium improved heavy lasers, and there are double heat sinks. Oh, and it has a supercharger, which pushes that running speed up to an 18 if you are willing to risk a progressively more challenging roll that, if failed, results in damage to the engine and destruction of the supercharger. If you're fighting in the O-Clan era and like to live on the edge, Piranha 5 might be for you. Speaking of the O-Clan era, the Piranha in various forms can now be found across the Inner Sphere, as Clan C. Fox has taken to selling them to just about anyone with the cash or credit to cover it. The mech has also found popularity on Solaris, as it can make a lot of noise with those machine guns, and a savvy pilot can take down targets far beyond the 20-ton weight class. Word is that Alaric's Wolf Empire has complained about the sale of this clan technology, but Sea Fox does whatever Sea Fox wants. In one interesting incident on Solaris, a black market mech parts dealer by the name of Vincent Johnson ended up running afoul of Clan Wolf occupation forces. He ended up having to flee from them using his Zellbringen Piranha through the streets and alleyways of the city with wolves in hot pursuit. Weapons went hot, and he ended up destroying a Hermes and a trebuchet before hitting open ground and making his escape thanks to the Piranha's speed. He hasn't been heard from since, and is likely no longer on Solaris 7. Ah, good times. If you haven't given the Piranha a try, I would strongly recommend you give it a go. It is such a unique mech design that I think it just might change a few opinions about machine guns on light mechs. If you have a Piranha story, let me know in the comments and we can keep the discussion going. Big thanks for watching and for the channel members and Ko-Fi supporters who are going above and beyond to keep content like this flowing onto the channel. I really do appreciate it. I don't do a lot of single mech videos, but the Piranha is one of my favorite mechs and I wanted to do this little tribute for it. Thanks again for watching. Till we meet again, Take care and go make the world a slightly better place today and tomorrow.